Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you guys today and also for those that have tuned in Facebook or YouTube Live. Grateful for that also. Another beautiful day that the Lord Amen. has given to us. Let's go to him in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, and praise you for this day. Thank you for providing just the, its beauty, and Lord, but just thank you for pro providing an opportunity to gather and worship and just open your word. And I pray you speak to each of our hearts this morning, Lord, whatever burdens, concerns, and cares, Lord, that you would carry those for us. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is true, your word, which will point us in the right direction. We pray you point us in the right direction this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen. 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 Well, we're going to start in Romans chapter 11, but we are going to bounce around a little bit today. Uh, I'm talking about pointing us in the, the right direction. You know, this past Sunday we saw Elijah was off course, and then God pointed him in the right direction. So we're going to be in Romans 11. But while you're turning there, just to remind you of some things that are coming up this uh, Saturday, we do have a men's breakfast at Hardy's. Uh, they're on Indian River Road. That's at 8 o'clock. Uh, so just come. We grab a table there and just uh, open God's Word and just look at that and pray. And so I encourage you to come uh, if you're able to come. Also, we continue to promote Operation Christmas Child. Uh, go ahead and get those boxes, the empty box. Fill it with the goodies that you're supposed to, the things, the items, uh, and then also bring that back. And so we want to see that ministry continue to flourish. And I'm grateful for each person that's already participated. But if you have questions about that, please see Charlene. She can help you uh, get a box to you and all those things. Also, we want to continue to pray for Israel, uh, the things that are taking place there. There is humanitarian relief, obviously, that is needed. And through Send Relief, we're able to, to do that. Again, Send Relief is the uh, disaster relief, uh, responding to different crisis modes for the Southern Baptist Convention. That's also here in North America, but also the international component to it. And so they're partnering with the Baptist Village, which is a ministry that's been in Israel for many, many years, uh, to meet humanitarian needs. And so we want to be in prayer for the people of Israel at this time. And, and we're going to be talking about that here in just a few moments. So in Romans chapter 11, I actually read this passage of Scripture this past Sunday. And it was based on the fact that Elijah, when he is there with the Lord on Mount Horeb, uh, he is there. God speaks to him and Elijah tells him, hey, look, I'm the only one left. You know, I'm, I'm running. He was running. Uh, from the presence of God and finally he comes to Mount Horeb and God says, Elijah, you know, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he talks about, I'm, I'm the only one that's zealous. I'm the only one that's serving. Uh, everyone else, I'm, I'm all alone. But in that passage there back in 1 Kings chapter 19, God reminds him, hey, uh, you're, you're not alone. Uh, you're, you're not the only one. And so let me read again in Romans chapter 11 because the Apostle Paul brings this forward from the Old Testament to make a point in the New Testament. He says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded? And so Paul is, if you understand the context in the book of Romans, he's making the case that Jews and Gentiles are saved the same way. They're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In the context, again, when Paul is writing to the church at Rome, 
there had been a disagreement or there was an ongoing disagreement in the church there. You see, when the first believers come there, um, what, they're, they're of a Jewish background. Because Paul, and you see this in the book of Acts, when he would go to a new city, he would, wear, he would go to the synagogue first and he would preach the gospel. And if people received it, then, you know, they kind of left the synagogue and they would, you know, begin to reach out in that community. But Paul was also reaching out to Gentiles. So the church at Rome had Jews and Gentiles in it, just like the other churches that we would see sprouting up in Corinth, Ephesus, and, and other places. Well, what happens is all the Jews are kicked out of Rome. Uh, there was a purge, so to speak. And so the Romans, they didn't care if you were a Jewish Christian or just a Jew, they kicked them all out of Rome. And so for a period of time, they were out, and who was left at the church in Rome, all Gentiles. So can you imagine what happens when the Jews finally get to come back to Rome and those Jews who had believed in Jesus came back and now they're gathering together and they're like, wait a minute, why y'all having pork at the potluck? You're not supposed to have pork at the potluck because as Jews, we don't eat pork and they're, they're beginning to clash because the Jews thought, well, you know, our traditions trump all the other traditions and Paul's writing no we're all sinners and we're all saved the same way by grace yeah, through yeah, faith yeah. but he's going to make a point here about his countrymen if you start in Romans chapter 9 all, all through in fact in Romans chapter 9 verses 6 and 8 he's going to talk about the fact that not all physical descendants of Abraham belong to Abraham he says not all Israel who are Israel what he's talking about is just being a physical descendant is not enough for you to be accepted in the presence of God. Okay. Yes, God gave his commands and he gave his promises to the Jewish nation and to the Jewish people. He gave that, but it was always been by grace through faith. Abraham was saved by grace through faith. He, what? Believed God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. We'll say that in Romans uh, chapter 4. So the point behind this is that Paul is praying for his countrymen. He's praying for them to receive Christ. He's going to go on later in Romans chapter 11 and talk about, you know, how uh, an olive tree, you know, if God took off some branches and then grafted other branches in, he says, don't, don't be too prideful. And he's going to basically say, God hasn't forgotten his people. But the Jews in Paul's day needed to believe in Jesus. And the people who were Jewish in our day and time, they need to believe in Jesus. But God still has a purpose and a plan for the people of Israel. He says there's what? A remnant. There's always going to be a remnant. There's going to be people who come out of a Jewish background who believe in Jesus Christ. They're not saved by keeping the Old Testament law. And no one was ever saved by keeping the Old Testament law because guess what? You can't. <laughs> It's impossible. We, we, we're, we fall short. We, we can't fulfill that. Uh, we're to live by the Ten Commandments because what? It is pleasing in the sight of God. But it was never given to us in order to save us from our sins. That is done by grace through faith. So Paul speaks about the fact that there's going to be a remnant. And I bring this up because of what's taking place in the world right now. You, you turn on the, the television and you see that there's a war in the Middle East. And it is a war. As uh, the Prime Minister of Israel had said, this isn't some military operation or whatever. This is war. And when it's war, it has a different end game. It has a different focus. And what's taking place uh, is just horrendous to see. Let's, let's just speak plainly about it. Hamas is wicked. Hamas is evil. Hamas is the aggressor in this, in this instance, and as they have been throughout the years. Their stated goal is to eliminate the nation of Israel. So Hamas is wicked. They don't want peace at all. Israel has a right to defend itself. It certainly has that right to do so. You know, it's interesting, Hamas intentionally kills the weak, intentionally kills the defenseless, intentionally inflicts harm on babies even. 
And Israel does not intentionally seek to harm the weak. But when responding to evil attacks, yes, do people, by, bystanders, suffer? Certainly. Unfortunately, that's the case. But whose fault is that? It's the ones who put their rockets in places like schools and other places like that that Israel has to respond to, and they know what's going to happen. I want to do a little history lesson for all of us on the one thing. It's like, what, what are they fighting about? I mean, what are, what, what's, what's at stake here? And I think if you have a secular mindset, you'll never understand. If you have that secular, elite, materialistic mindset, you'll never comprehend because they look at it as just, well, this group wants this and this group wants that and, and maybe, you know, let's just reason with it. If you don't see this as a theological issue, you'll never understand what's taking place. If you don't look at this as a theological uh, underpinning to it, you'll never fully comprehend. Liberal elites cannot understand because of their secular mindset. What's at place here, and this is when you ultimately get down to it, I'm again, speaking from my perspective, but I believe it's backed up by scripture here, that ultimately this is a theological question that goes down to who did God give the land to? Who did God give the land to? And the question, that's the question. And the answer, how do you find that? Is in the scripture, is in the word of God. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham and he calls him out of Ur the Chaldees. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, he says, I will give this land to you and your descendants. So it's Abraham. Now let's back up a second here again. Does God have the right to give the land to whoever he wants? God is God. He's the owner of the heavens and the earth. He's created everything. And if he says, I'm giving this land to you, Abraham, and your descendants, then that's God's authority. And God has that right to do. And again, if you have a secular mindset, well, you won't believe that. You won't accept that. That's not a good enough thing. That's just superstition. And no, that's the revelation of God. That is God's purpose in this world. And we know that God is going to bless all the nations of the earth through one particular descendant of Abraham, who is Christ. And so don't lose sight of that thing. But in the meantime, God says, I'm giving you this land to you and your descendants. Well, we know that Abraham uh, waits and waits to have a descendant. He and Sarah don't have a child. So they get the bright idea Sarah gives her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham and says, well, here, have a child by her, and that'll be my child. And so, unfortunately, he follows through with that, and we're still paying the price today. That's in Genesis chapter 16. In fact, look with me in Genesis chapter 16. This is after Hagar conceives. And now Sarah is, like, upset because... It was her idea, and now she's going to drive out Hagar from there. But in Genesis chapter 16, beginning in verse 9, again, Hagar has fled from Sarah's presence. It says in verse 9, The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that you shall not be Count it for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And so God makes a promise to Hagar that, yes, your child will have descendants. You will have descendants, and there'll be a great multitude, but his name will be Ishmael. And if you go through all of Scripture, you're going to see that Ishmael is not the child of promise. Ishmael was by Hagar. God had promised a descendant through Abraham and Sarah, and later she has 
Isaac. And we see in Genesis 21 that Sarah, after Isaac is born, says, look, we're, we're not going to have this split household. And Ishmael is kicked out. Hagar and, and they go their way. And I point this out because Islam sees Ishmael as the child of promise. They, they go back and say, we're descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Now, do you see both sides are saying this land was given to us? The Muslims would say it was given to Abraham. Abraham's first son is Ishmael. Therefore, it belongs to us. And the scripture says, no, Ishmael was not the child of promise. Isaac is the child of promise. And Isaac is the one through whom his descendants will be blessed. And so it goes through all of that. So it's through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's at the root of what's taking place in the Middle East. That's why Hamas does not want any type of peace with Israel. Because they say this land belongs to us. And Israel is saying, no, this, this land was given to us and it belongs to us. And if you look historically, who actually had a kingdom in that area would be Israel under David and Solomon. And then others had the, even after Solomon, had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel was in the land. I mean, there's no question about that. And had a kingdom there. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. Moses cannot go into the promised land. But if you read that in Deuteronomy 34, let's look that real quick. Let me just read it. Read that one for you. It's the very last part right before Moses passes away. He's not able to go into the promised land, but he gets to see it. And notice what God tells to Moses. Verse 1, chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Nephtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants, I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So that's the picture here. Here is Moses. Because of his sin, is not able to enter into the promised land. But he does get to see it. And God puts him up on the Mount Nebo, and he can see the whole thing. And I believe you can still go to that place today, Mount Nebo. And you can look, and on a clear day, you can see this region, this area. The point is, God reaffirm that promise who the land belongs to. And so I say all of this because what you're seeing take place in the world right now is unfortunately a lot of people are going to turn against Israel. They're going to turn against them as they respond to being attacked. You, you see some of it even now. You see protests on college campuses and places that are like pro-Hamas. It's kind of like do these people not realize what Hamas stands for, what Hamas has done? But they're so bought into the, the lies of the world that they, they can't see straight. But that's where we need to let Scripture speak to us and point us in the right direction. We as believers in Jesus Christ, we serve Christ first and foremost. And we are to proclaim the gospel to everyone, to Jew and Gentile. Whether someone's of a Muslim background or a Jewish background, we're to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Paul, going as we go back to Romans chapter 11, that's the point he's making, is that the gospel is still is for all people. And we all receive him the same way. Yes, God has a purpose and a plan for the nation of Israel. And see, there's some people who think that, well, the church replaced Israel, and so what's taking place over there, that doesn't have anything to do with Bible prophecy, and it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's kind of like, no, I... I think the Bible is pretty clear that God is still dealing with his people. 
And he's wanting them to come in. But it's interesting when you read a little bit later, it talks about that the, the fullness of the Gentiles is what is waiting. It's waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in so that what God will then deal with his nation, Israel, and they will turn to him. They will come to him. And so we need to just trust the Lord in these moments. We need to support the, the nation of Israel. Are they perfect? No. Not by any means. Are unfortunately innocent people going to die? Yes, unfortunately. And we all want to, to minimize that. And I would say that Israel is taking steps to minimize that to the extent possible. But we need to recognize that there is a difference between good and evil. And there can be no question who the evil is in this situation. And it's not Israel. It's Hamas is the one. And so we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for God's uh, wisdom for our leaders at this time. We've talked about it before. It would be easy for this to spill over in way unintended consequences. I don't even want to try to imagine those things. But we as believers need to be firm and understand that God is still in control, that God has a purpose and a plan for the people of Israel. He has a purpose and a plan for them. And our purpose and plan is to proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the gospel to, to everyone. To, to the people in Gaza, to the people in Israel, to the people everywhere. We're to proclaim the gospel of Jesus and the hope, for he is our only hope. And again, are these events pointing to the return of Christ? Well, in one sense, in a generic sense, yes, because there will always be wars and rumors of wars. There will be earthquakes and famines and all those things. And all of these kinds of things are taking place. And so could it be? Certainly. But do I know that for certain? No, I don't know that for certain. But as I always like to remind us, I do know this for certain. We're one day closer to Jesus coming back and fixing this. And, and that's our hope. And in the meantime, we proclaim the gospel so that Jesus will fix a person's heart, fix a person's life. So let us trust in the Lord. Uh, the scripture, let's look at this situation not from earthly eyes, but let's look at it through the lens of scripture. It is clear who God gave the land to. He gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants. But he's also made a way that through one of their descendants, he's made a way for us to come into his presence. And that one descendant is Jesus. And he's the one we must proclaim. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this time. Thank you for your word, which, Lord, is clear. You gave the land to Abraham and to his descendants through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we know that there was another descendant named Ishmael, and that Muslims and others looked to him as the one that the promise was given to. And Lord, we don't know how this is going to be reconciled as it plays out in our, in our lives at this particular moment. But we know it's not catching you by surprise. And you understand. And you have all the wisdom. So Lord, I pray that you would pour out your wisdom at this time, Lord, upon the leaders in Israel, Lord, upon the United States and others who would stand with Israel. Give wisdom at this time, Father, that would minimize casualties, minimize destruction. Lord, we pray that humanitarian relief can take place for people in Israel and also in Gaza, Lord, who need Jesus just like all of us. So, Father, let us just surrender to you. Let us proclaim Christ. Lord, let us rejoice that you still have work for us to do. We just pray this in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen. Amen. Again, I appreciate y'all being here today. And again, those that tuned in as well, let's say our vision verse together. We'll conclude this time. Declare his glory among the nations. We get to do this.
God bless you. Thank you.